WRAL News. Good evening and thanks for joining us for On the Record. I'm your host, Lena Tillette. We begin tonight with news reverberating around the world. For the first time in history, a former president of the United States has been convicted of criminal conduct. Donald Trump was found guilty of 34 felony counts of falsifying business records by a jury of his peers. He will be sentenced on July 11th at 10 a.m. by Judge Juan Marchand, a date that happens to be four days before the Republican National Convention begins. We have been guided through this trial for weeks now by someone with rare insight. Duke Law Professor Shane Stansberry is a former federal prosecutor. He once worked with both the top prosecutor in this case, Alvin Bragg, and Trump's defense attorney, Todd Blanche. Great to see you, Professor. Good to see you. So in my last interview with you, you practically described to a T how the prosecution and defense would present their closing arguments. You said that the defense would focus almost entirely on Michael Cohen's credibility issues and that the prosecution would say, Michael Cohen isn't our star witness. The documents are. What do you make of this outcome? Well, I'll just start by saying it's it's a pretty sobering day. Um, we were all sort of expecting this day, but to see it finally come... Um, is uh, pretty surreal. So um, I was prepared for any type of verdict. Uh, I didn't expect uh, an outright acquittal. I uh, expected that there could be a conviction or uh, possibly a mixed verdict, but I can't say I was terribly surprised by the verdict, uh, particularly uh, given the timing of it. Uh, but it is, uh, I think we should all just pause and reflect that this is, um, it's not a, uh, um, I don't think anybody should be jumping for joy. Um, uh, it's a sobering day. I also think that um, uh, people need to be careful about uh, how they treat this verdict. People can have very strong opinions. What I'm thinking about today, particularly as a former prosecutor, is the jury, uh, the 12 citizens who rendered that verdict. And um, we all need to be careful about how we talk about this case and how we um, uh, treat uh, one another and uh, talk about the witnesses and, and the jury that was involved in this case. What was the most compelling piece of evidence in this trial, in your opinion? So uh, I don't think that it was any one piece of evidence, uh, but for the prosecution, I think it was uh, the way they pulled together uh, the body of evidence and presented it in the way that they did. Uh, they uh, knew that their star witness, Michael Cohen, was their biggest liability, and they uh, built the case around uh, the witnesses and the documents and other evidence that was going to corroborate his uh, testimony, and they pre-corroborated his testimony by presenting all of that evidence well before he testified so that the jury um, heard the story and heard the strength of the evidence before they even got there. Some thought that uh, the prosecution's closing arguments went too long, I mean, more than four hours, and that it was potentially too exhaustive. Do you think that that helped the jury? So uh, I think it's easy for everyone to sort of Monday morning quarterback on both sides. Uh, you know, you can always say, well, uh, obviously they did the right thing because they got a conviction and uh, you might point fingers at the defense for uh, doing uh, things the way they did. Um, at the end of the day, I think that uh, those kinds of things uh, matter less than you might expect, uh, particularly for a jury like this that I think was... Um, very focused on the facts and the evidence. They asked a lot of questions. They, uh, they they gave the judge several notes. Uh, they were very focused on the evidence, and I think more on that than the performances. The defense never presented an ulterior story, right? They just said Michael Cohen can't be believed. I know you said you don't want a Monday morning quarterback, but do you think that was a mistake? Should they have presented something else for the jury to consider? Yeah, it's uh, it's difficult to answer that because there are a variety of strategies you can use as a defense lawyer, and your job is not necessarily to present a coherent story. The prosecution needs to do that, um, but the defense, it's very common for the defense to, uh, to, to sort of um, present a number of different uh, theories in which the, the jury could infer reasonable doubt. Uh, so they're all about poking holes. Now, what I will say is that uh, there were some, uh, there was a set of documents 
um, exhibits 35 and 36 in particular that were very strong uh, uh, proof of the uh, falsification of business records. These were uh, handwritten notes by um, uh, Alan Weisselberg, for example. And uh, you, you saw evidence like that, and they didn't necessarily have Mr. Trump's handwriting or his direct involvement. Uh, but I think that um, what you could say is that the jury might have been looking for the defense to give them uh, a better story or understanding as to uh, why those documents would exist if Mr. Trump was not involved in the scheme that was alleged. So you can point to things like that, but the, the de at the end of the day, I think the, the defense did a fine job. And I will say, uh, I, I should point out that all of the lawyers, I think, handled themselves well. They put on a great case um, on the prosecution side. I think on the defense side, they did a, 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 an admirable, jo admirable job and they, they conducted themselves well. And the judge should be commended for uh, handling a very difficult case. You know, to that end, I did want to play uh, this short soundbite from former President Trump after the verdict came out because he had a different reaction to how this was run. Let's take a listen. This was a disgrace. This was a rigged trial by a conflicted judge who was corrupt. It's a rigged trial, a disgrace. They wouldn't give us a venue change. This was done by the Biden administration in order to wound or hurt an opponent, a political opponent. And I think it's a, just a disgrace. And we'll keep fighting. We'll fight till the end. So, again, you have worked with both sides. You've worked in SDNY. How do you think this process was run? I mean, do you think that it was fair? Yeah, I think you need to segregate out uh, two different things. Um, one is, I think that there are um, reasonable arguments on both sides as to whether the case should have been brought at all. So uh, that's a judgment call that was made by Alvin Bragg, the DA. And I think uh, I, I think there's fair criticism of him as to whether or not this should have been a case that was brought. Um, and then I think if you uh, put that in one bucket, and then you if you put in another uh, the case for what it is and how it was tried. And remember, uh, these were line prosecutors uh, who were doing their job and bringing this case. Uh, there were 12 ordinary Americans who didn't ask for the job of being in the jury. Uh, there was a judge who didn't ask for this case. And I think if you assess that part uh, and how the, the folks who were involved in this case conducted themselves, uh, I, I was impressed because this was not easy for anyone involved you can imagine how this could have gone if uh, the lawyers uh, weren't good, uh, if the judge wasn't experienced. It could have easily gone off the rails. And so I was looking at it more from an institutional perspective uh, and what we should expect from the criminal justice system once it's in motion. And I think that the parties who were involved, I think, uh, conducted themselves like professionals. Uh, and so uh, that's all I'll say about that. OK, what is the likelihood that Trump spends any time in jail. We know that he could potentially just receive probation, but then he could also spend years in state prison. What do you think will happen? So sentencing is set for July 11th, um, and the, uh, the offense uh, that he's con being convicted of, 34 counts uh, of a, uh, what is it, an E felony. So this is a, a pretty low level felony under New York law. It carries up to four years, but I, I don't think anyone would expect him to get uh, even four years, much less uh, beyond that for the additional counts. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of pressure on this judge to avoid uh, jail time. Uh, I mean, we have to remember this is just a, a, a really um, historic moment when we have a former president who's been convicted of a felony. Uh, and regardless of what you think about that, I mean, it is uh, this is a, a one of a kind case. Uh, and we also can't uh, forget the fact that he's a nominee or soon to be nominee uh, for president in our, our next election. All of that's going to weigh on the judge. And I think there's going to be a lot of pressure to avoid jail time. We will certainly uh, be anticipating some appeals in the future, and who knows how that will extend the potential sentencing. Professor Stansberry, thank you so much for joining us and for guiding us through this trial. Thank you.
Coming up, we just marked another foster care awareness month. And in North Carolina, new indicators point to trouble finding families and getting children into safe homes. We talked to experts, including a foster parent, after the break. Welcome back. We want to talk about some numbers now, numbers that may surprise you or even alarm you. 32, on average, 32 children every week are living in their local social services office because there's no home for them to go to. 15%, the number of foster homes available in North Carolina has fallen by 15% over the past five years. And 10,000, roughly 10,000 children in this state are currently in the foster care system. All this information was provided to us by the State Department of Health and Human Services. Tonight, we're examining the state of foster care in North Carolina. We just marked another Foster Care Awareness Month with troubling indicators of where the system is headed. We are fortunate to have a panel with rare insight into the state system and into what makes a good foster family to begin with. Kimmery Sanders is the Section Chief for Regulatory and Licensing in Child Welfare in the Division of Social Services. Joining me in studio, thank you so much for being here. And joining us via Zoom is Gail Osborne, the Executive Director of Foster Family Alliance, which supports and advocates for foster families. Ms. Osborne, I'd like to begin with you because you are a foster care, a foster parent yourself. And I think a lot of people want to know what moves you to become a foster parent. So, so what moved you? For us, it, it started out as a journey of infertility and medical issues, and we wanted to grow our family. And so 14 years ago, we started that. And I have to say that within the first two years of fostering, I realized that that wasn't what foster care was about. Um, Foster care was about serving a child that needed us in one of the most vulnerable parts of their lives so far. And, you know, it was our job as a foster parent to help this child reunify with their family. How difficult was that? I know you've had several placements at this point. You've told me that. How difficult was it to part with a child? It was one of those moments that changes you forever. It's it's these children make a a, a place in your heart that you truly will grieve when they leave. However, when they reunify, it's a celebration. It's a family on the other end who has put everything they've got out on the table and they have fought for their child. They have overcome obstacles. And, you know, it's that moment where you're thinking about yourself and your heart's hurting, but it's not really even about me. It's about those children that are making it back home to their families. Incredibly selfless. Ms. Sanders, where is the greatest need right now? And among which population? Mm-hmm. So right now, our great, we call them like our special populations, like large sibling groups or older youth, um, LGBTQIA plus communities. Those are the type of placements, um, those populations that we need homes for. Um, usually it's a little challenging at times. However, the state is taking a new approach and kind of really working and supporting and doing re- mm, recruitment efforts and mm-hmm. stuff. So we usually left that kind of to the counties and not that the local Department of Social Services are not responsible for that. Mm-hmm. However, the state is now doing its own like statewide foster um, parent awareness campaign just to make sure that everybody is aware that there is still a need out there. Are there more, is there a greater need in rural communities compared to urban populations or not necessarily? Not necessarily, it will just depend on their foster care populations. Um, Typically, sometimes the larger counties do have um, less foster parents, but it just really depends and it depends on the county. Ms. Osborne, you told me when you started fostering that it was rare that babies needed to be fostered, but that's not the case anymore, right? And it's being, uh, that is happening in part because of this horrible opioid epidemic. I never in the beginning got phone calls about infants coming out of NICUs or, you know, even kids under the age of two, whereas now it seems that the calls are coming in more and more and families are needing support from day one. I mean, what goes through your mind knowing that you're picking up a baby from the NICU? 
it's incredibly sad to know that there's a mom on the other side that's not taking this child home um, and, and to know that the need is there and for us to step in and be able to serve this child for however long we get. Um, but it's also a moment where it can be such an amazing opportunity to come along the side of that family that the child's not going home to. Whew. Uh, thinking of that just just breaks your heart, but you're right that there is an opportunity mm -hmm. as a foster family to pour love into that child. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about that second number I mentioned, the 15% drop in foster parents over the past five years. Mm -hmm. What's attributing to that? So some of it started during the pandemic. We started to see a decrease um, during that time. Also, sometimes foster parents, their goal is sometimes to adopt, and once they have adopted, they stop fostering. Um, so there's a combination of reasons why the numbers have dropped. Sometimes it's just simply maybe lack of support, just to be real transparent. Um, sometimes and they might not feel like they're getting the support that they need. However, um, it's very important that we know that we do need foster parents, and Ms. Gale is a great example as the reason why we need more foster parents. What makes a good foster family? That's very hard to define, you know what I mean? Because yeah. you don't have to be this big, perfect family with this big, you know, white picket fence house or anything like that. You just have to have the love, the patience, and the time to provide that um, care for that child at that time. Well, coming up, we're going to look at new efforts to recruit foster families and new programs to support children. That's after the break. Welcome back. We are discussing the state of the foster care system in North Carolina. Ms. Osborne, I wanted to present that question to you that I asked Ms. Sanders about before the break, about that drop in foster families in North Carolina, because I imagine that has an impact on the entire system when there are fewer families. What are you hearing? Because you're an advocate for families. You support these families. What are you hearing about why they're deciding not to be foster families? So Ms. Sanders spoke to the idea that we're not getting the support that we need. And, you know, basically we're looking at a workforce that is completely turning over. It seems like every time we're turning around with our social workers. And so we end up having inexperienced and um, fewer social workers than we had, say, even five years ago or 10 years ago. And so foster families are having to do more advocating, more connecting than we've done in the past. And so we hear that quite often. But we also hear the lack of being able to connect to get the right mental health services or the medical services that we need for the children. And so it foster parents are frustrated in that sense. And so we, we want, you know, to be able to get better help all around. What is your pitch then to foster families about why they should do something that requires such an immense responsibility? Mm -hmm. it, it's all about the kid. Um, it's all about the relationship. It's all about supporting that child and that family and watching, even if a parent can't, can't fully step in and parent, that parent can do something. And to watch that and be part of that solution for a child. And, you know, and I keep saying for however long we get, that is what you go in for. And I, I just told someone the other day, as a foster parent, you don't stick one toe in the freezing lake. You take your entire body, everything you have, all of you, you know, anything you can throw at this and you go in full force. Whew, Ms. Sanders, the state has launched the Emergency Placement Fund, and they did this to try to address the overflow of children, but also uh, to recruit families to help in some way. Kind of describe what this fund is supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So the Emergency Placement Fund stems from the $80 million package that um, the legislation gave for behavioral health initiatives. Mm -hmm. So one of the initiatives that Child Welfare has taken on is the Emergency Placement Fund. It is a preventative measure in order to prevent children and youth to stay in DSS hospitals or in emergency rooms. Um, so, and there's various ways that these funds can be used. The first um, way is that you can pay a retainer to a foster parent um, to avoid a child um, with high risk, um, high behavioral complex needs to stay in a DSS. They can stay in a short term in um, an emergency respite kind of placement. Mm. And we affectionately call that the Harnett County model because they brought that model to us. Um, the second way is to like, um, the same thing with a foster parent, paying them an enhanced rate in order to kind of provide additional services and support for a child and youth in care. 
And the third way that these funds can be utilized is, and these have to be approved by um, us, the division, is finding a creative way or um, practice or something like that that mm -hmm. maybe can be sustained to be um, utilized. Like say, for example, we did have, we approved um, monies for, there was a child, she had complex behavioral needs and unfortunately could not be maintained in daycare. So instead of a placement disruption, which would also, you know, compound issues with her, they were able to find a foster parent that would provide the care and stuff that she needed mm -hmm. while the other foster parent worked. So it was a great way to prevent that um, placement disruption and stuff. So the funds can be used in those kind of ways. You know, uh, Ms. Osborne and, and you just alluded to uh, complex behavioral needs, also mental health challenges. We already know that there are space issues at, um, at hospitals, finding appointments with therapists. Mm -hmm. I mean, how difficult is it to kind of, uh, how compounding is that to not have those kinds of resources to support these families? Mm -hmm. It can be a little challenging, like Ms. Osborne alluded to. Um, but we're hoping with the new behavioral health initiatives and stuff, because behavioral health themselves also has their own initiatives, and we, Child Welfare, has two additional initiatives that we're going to be rolling out. Hopefully in time, this will not be the crisis that it is. You know, Ms. Osborne, uh, you said something to me that I thought was beautiful. You said this to me off camera, that even if you don't feel equipped to be a foster family, there are ways that the community can support foster families and certainly support these children. Tell us how. There's nothing greater than after spending the day doing therapies and, and picking up extra kids and extracurriculars to have a hot meal ready or to have someone that says, hey, you go take a break for 15, 20 minutes. Let me stay here and feed the kids. Um, you know, we have the saying at our organization that not everyone can foster, but everyone can do something. And so the natural thing is to ask a foster family, you know, what do you need? And if they're like us, I'm probably going to say, no, nope, we're good, but jump in, offer to do things, offer to run an errand. Um, I think when we talked previously, I shared, um, I had returns that needed to go back to the UPS store for Amazon. And I had somebody pull up at the house and say, hey, I'll, I'll take care of that. Let me take it for you. And Ms. Sanders, that's such a beautiful concept. I mean, it brings the community in. It's the, the concept of a village raising a child in its truest form. Uh, is there, are there other ways that the community can support financially? Can we hold drives? You know, uh, I think of how expensive baby products are. I mean, what else can the community do? Yes, they can um, hold drives and stuff like that because there's always a need for, like you said, baby products, baby items, even for older youth. A lot of times we do focus on babies, but there's also yes. older youth and stuff, and they also have their needs, clothes, game, you know, games and things like that, anything to kind of support them. They're in a temporary placement at the worst part of their lives at the, that moment. And so anything that the community can do or we can do to kind of ease that pain for them, I think we should just jump in and do that. Kim Marie Sanders, Gail Osborne, thank you so much for your insight. That was really moving. If you have something to say about tonight's discussion, you can email us on the record at WRAL.com. You can also find me on Facebook at Lena Tillette. Find a way to help these families. Have a great night.